everyone, and welcome to Behind the Numbers. I'm Dave Bookbinder, and welcome to the show where we dig deeper to understand what matters most in business. Today, we're going to be talking about the impact of leadership on the bottom line with Dr. Andy Neely, uh, who is the founder of Neely Leadership Group and also author of the book, The Golden Principles, Life and Leadership, Lessons from a Rescued Dog. Andy, welcome to Behind the Numbers. Uh, glad to be with you. Looking forward to a spirited discussion. Yeah, likewise, and I'm sure our audience is also. So to kick it off, why don't you tell us what inspired you to, to found the Neely Leadership Group and, and what do you do in that capacity? Well, I work with managers, helping them uh, transform themselves into leaders. And, and really, it came from kind of two paths, Dave. Um, first of all, I just had a bad boss early in my career. In fact, it was really even before my career. I was a high school and college kid working construction in the summers to pay my way through school uh, and uh, and my crew foreman had anger management issues and at one point he physically struck out at me and I just remember thinking you know what this guy is not just a bad boss he, he's a bad person and part of that just started me on this quest for what makes a good leader a good leader and, and parallel to that I, I found my faith early in my life, and, and as I'm reading through the gospel accounts, I'm seeing a model of servant leadership that is other-oriented and humble and sacrificial, and I'm working in an environment where that's not happening and trying to aspire to be the type of person that the gospels challenge us to be, and it just awakened in me a passion around, really, no bad bosses. However, when I got ready to launch Neely Leadership Group, I had some marketing people around me who said, Andy, having a negative message is probably not the right message. So we turn managers into leaders is our tagline. And really, I've been working for more than 25 years now, Dave, inside organizations as a consultant and a trainer. I do some keynotes. I've written some books. I do some coaching. My very best day is when I get to work with the folks that you work and helping them understand that alongside the numbers, supporting the numbers, behind the numbers, as they grow from managers into becoming high-performing leaders, it has bottom line impact. Yeah, it's funny when you started out by saying that uh, you worked for a bad boss, and uh, it's funny that so many people try to develop their own leadership style based upon, I don't want to be that guy. You know, similarly with parenting, right? Uh, I don't want to emulate those characteristics. I just want to grab the other stuff. but. Oftentimes, without the right role model to show you what the good stuff is, you're, you're kind of guessing. It, 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 so leadership is one of these topics, Andy, that is super popular. We talk about it a lot on this program also. Um, is it really in the forefront now as I'm seeing it, or are we still facing a deficit of good leaders? Well, I think part of the challenge, Dave, is none of us quite know how to def define leadership. It's 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 one of those things where we know when it's present, but we don't want know what's lacking when it's not there. And, and 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 it's not that you are either a manager or a leader. Management is about the doing of the team, the production, the the measurement, the goal setting. Leadership is also about that, but leadership is also about vision. It's about connection with your team members. When, when leaders lead well, employee turnover drops, customer service scores go up, mission is more easily accomplished, profitable numbers are more easily driven to the bottom line, but it remains an elusive characteristic. So I've been looking like, at folks like you for, as I said, more than a couple of decades now, and I, I think I've been able to develop a simple construct. When I, when I look at managers who are, who are transforming themselves into high-performing leaders, there's there's four broad areas that they're growing in that moves them from managers to leaders. Well, I'm not going to let that hang out there, Andy. I'm going to have to ask you to unpack that, of course. Sure, 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 sure of course. So first of all, it's the whole area of conviction, strategy, passion. Uh, workers and even frontline managers live in today and tomorrow and, and maybe next week. Part of, what, part of what somebody who wants to become a leader needs to do is they need to they need to be thinking bigger than just their corner of the plant they need to be thinking broader into the industry itself competitive environment geographic and territorial impact things like that broader economy things and then they need to be thinking further into the future 18 months three years five years things like that bigger broader and further the the second leadership necessity 
Dave, is the necessity of uh, competence. And this is the one that, in some respects, might track well with management excellence. But, but now leaders that are emerging as high-performing leaders, it's not just about their own competence. It's about their ability to get their teams to execute well in, in times of risk and uncertainty. Decision-making, when you don't have all the information that you need, those become the measurements of effective leadership. So, so conviction, competence, and then the third one, you and I could probably talk for the balance of our time together about the issue of character. You will never be a better leader than you are a person. Fair-minded, uh, honest, other-oriented, balanced. Uh, the, Jerry, the, the anger management boss that I worked for so many years ago now, it was just all about him, right? He was having a bad day. The entire crew was having a bad day. You'll, you'll never be a better, a better leader than you are a person. So conviction, competence, character. And then, Dave, the, the, the last element I, I, I was seeing, I couldn't quite get my hands around it really for a long time and articulate it concisely. I, I, I called it uh, consistency, alignment, communication. And then I came across an old-fashioned word that really needs to be brought back into the 21st century, and that's the word covenant. Leaders are in covenant with their teams. And, and, and really, very briefly, a, a covenant is both a formal and a personal contract. Here in the state of Texas where I live, if somebody's going to get married, they have a marriage covenant, and it's all about affection and love forever and ever, you know, in sickness and in health and riches and importance. There's that, that personal connection. There's also an officiant who signs a formal document that's recorded at the Secretary of State. And, and when, I, when I look at leaders that are good, they balance the tension, the ongoing tension of putting their people first and driving their organizations to a 20% bottom line or whatever their numbers are that they're targeting. So, so there's a, a dynamic tension of serving their people and serving the, the mission uh, of the organization. Talked at you a long time, but those are the four things. Conviction, competence, character, covenant. Manager gets those right, they're becoming a high-performing leader. That, that's really good stuff. And I, I want to talk to you about, I guess I'll call it a feedback loop, Andy. So as, as you're out there being a leader of an organization, leader of teams, what have you, uh, how do you know if, if you're being a good leader or a bad leader? Ostensibly, if you're a bad leader, you'll start to see it manifest with turnover, and yeah, maybe yeah. Some, some negative reviews on glass door, but how do you know if you're doing it right? Yeah, well, so I would say the converse of that, when, when you can look across your industry and see we're having a lower turnover rate than many of our competitors, we've got people that are performing their meeting budget and exceeding budget, we've got customer service scores, NPS scores that are climbing and that are you know world class in the 60s and 70s rather than in the 30s and 40s. Um, and then when we see people, you know, inside organizations, do you have the team that other team members want to work with or even work for if they have the opportunity to move? Those are some of the ways you can measure leadership. But Dave, I see you taking some notes on that. It's, it's hard to define, isn't it? That's why I think I will always have a job because this elusive, are we becoming high performing leaders question can never fully be answered. We're always in process. Yeah, and look, you, you work with a lot of people and coach them up the curve to become better leaders. Uh, is there an aha moment that these folks have when they realize I, I need some additional support on that? How do they come to realize that they, they need to work with you? Yeah, I, I think at times, to be real honest, with the clients I work with, a lot of times there's an aha moment for other people in their organization. I, I'm coaching an emerging executive right now where the people around this executive said, hey, Andy, um, this person needs to elevate their site. And, and, and really the challenge I'm having in every coaching conversation I have with this, this uh, protege of mine is, are you working on the business instead of in the business? The, uh, the conviction piece and the, the covenant piece, this person, loves to put their head down and get stuff done, which is an admirable trait and organizations need that. But if this person is gonna emerge into the leadership capability that they could have, they've gotta take a step back and become more people oriented and, and see the bigger picture, that bigger, broader, further. I'm not sure if they were fully aware of that or at this point, to be real honest, I'm not even sure that this person is fully bought into this journey. 
But the challenge for this person is, can they begin to work on their business rather than in their business? Yeah, well said. And, and you mentioned that leadership impacts both recruitment and retention. And I, I certainly, certainly get it on the retention side. You're going to lose people. People don't quit their job. They quit their boss. That's still true. Uh, but talk a little bit about how leadership impacts recruitment. Um, my, my first thinking is that your employees are your evangelists, if you will, and, and telling uh, future candidates about what a great place it is to work. But let me throw it to you. How does leadership impact yeah. the, the recruitment? Well, side? I would say that's first and foremost. Your glass door reviews are strong. The, the, the team that works for you spreads the word to people that they know that this is a great place to work. And, and then I think it ends up being borne out also in, um, in, the, in the fact that when leadership is done well, uh, it contributes to the bottom line. And as a result, organizations grow and can be more successful in the market than their competitors. And as a result, they're hiring more than their competitors. So I think all three of those play out. But I would say first and foremost, uh, when a leader is leading well, there's a pipeline of other people that have heard the good news and want to come to work for them. Got it. And Andy, for the folks out there who are watching and listening to this conversation and want to learn more about you or how they can work with you, what's the best way for them to get in contact? Yeah, a couple ways. Neely Leadership Group, you mentioned it uh, earlier. Uh, our website, the good thing is my last name is spelled so distinctly, it's easy to find, N-E-I-L-L-I-E, -L -L -E, Neely Leadership. And in fact, I've got a link to my calendar there to jump on a short call. The other thing, Dave, is I make available to, uh, to your listeners uh, uh, at leadershipmaterials.com a simple little download, an eight-page ebook on the three imperative leadership conversations, the three conversations every leader needs to be having, the hard conversation, the co coaching conversation, the threefold affirmation conversation. So if they go to leadershipmaterials.com, give us their email address, we'll send them that ebook, and then they'll also be uh, able to get in contact with me. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. I'll try to remember to put that in the show notes as well. Uh, we only have a couple of minutes to go here before we go to a commercial break, Andy, but I wanted to ask you to talk about the book for just a moment, if you don't mind. Uh, the, sure. the Golden Principles, Life and Leadership, Lessons from a Rescued Dog. Yeah, we, my wife and I have rescued 11 dogs over the years. We've been rescuing dogs since four years into our marriage. And, and uh, uh, I think I've learned more about leading well from these dogs. Um, and they've all been rescues, which means many of them have come with some baggage, with some issues. There, were, there was a reason they were turned in and they required they required work on our part to reach them. And, and, and I just remember a number of years ago, in fact, the, the, the picture of the dog over my shoulder, that's Redford on the cover of the book. And he came from a puppy mill and was just beaten and neglected and abused and malnourished. And, and when we rescued him, uh, Dave, we knew that he had cashed in his chips, that, that living at the Neely household, this was as good as it was. I don't know what doggy heaven looks like, but it, probably looks a lot like our backyard. Um, the problem was he didn't know that for weeks and months. And our ability to love him well, to pull him out, to earn trust, really taught us a lot of things about how to be more purposeful as people and, and really as leaders. A uh, book publisher heard that story at one point and said, you got any other dog stories? And I said, man, I think despite my doctorate, despite the businesses I've built, despite all the consulting I've done, I think I've learned more lessons on leadership from having to get down into a play bow to not scare my dog and to take off my glasses and my hat and not yell out at the top of my lungs when I walk in the door and to not yank on the leash quite so hard, but to come alongside them and simple lessons like that, that, that it ends up being like a chicken soup for the soul for leaders book that most of us can relate to. Yeah, that's good stuff. And it does resonate. I mean, I personally am an owner of two rescue cats. And uh, we like to say in our house that they're living their best life. We found them and they were, they were playing with toys. The toys were straws. Um, so in terms of things I've learned from them, uh, conflict resolution, and they're doing the best to teach me how to be lazy, but I just cannot grasp that. It's just not <laughs> wired that way. Anyway, well, on I know that, the diligence that you and I have worked together to try to get this uh, podcast scheduled. I know that you're a hard worker. You've, you've grinded through some schedule challenges. I appreciate that. I'm what they call politely persistent. But on that note, Andy, you said tight. We've got to pay a few bills here. So for you folks watching and listening, don't go anywhere. But we'll be right back after this quick break.
Hi, I'm Angela Pipersberg, and I have a new show here in RVN Television called The Angela Pipersberg Show. And I want you to join me every week as I sit with guests and we discuss their life journeys, share wisdom, and tips that will inspire you to live your best life. Don't miss The Angela Pipersberg Show every week here on RVN Television, where we're celebrating life and we're inspiring you to greatness. Hi, I'm Dr. Esther Malave, and welcome to my show, Achieving a Better You. Through this show, we're going to explore ways to make a better version of you. For example, nutrition, finance, fitness, health. Remember that there's always a way of making a better version of yourself, no matter what the circumstances are. And remember to look for Achieving a Better You show on RVN TV. Some say the world has never been more divided, more self-centered, more uncaring, that we've never been more disconnected. But through our windows, we're able to see so much good every day. And it's clear that a And welcome back to Behind the Numbers. I'm Dave Bookbinder, and we're talking with Andy Neely. Andy, welcome back to the second segment here. Um, I mentioned to you during the quick commercial break that I want to start you off with a fun fact, but I didn't tell you what it is. So this is a fact that I've shared before, uh, and it's about when people get their leadership training. The average age in the U.S., as I understand it, when people get promoted to manager is 31. And the average age when somebody gets their first leadership training is about a decade later. So we're, we're creating this, this pool of inexperienced managers. So let me ask you, with, with that as the backdrop, what, what's your advice for, for the young managers who are taking on a new role, now responsible, and, and wearing the moniker of leader? Where, where do they start? Well, they're going to have to they're going to have to develop themselves in some respects. So the great thing is there's podcasts like your podcast. There's really strong, good leadership podcasts out there. I would say if you haven't dived into some personal and professional leadership books, John Maxwell for personal side of leading well, you know, Jim Collins and uh, the Coos and Posner leadership challenge book. And if you haven't uh, availed yourself of some of those personal development uh, areas you need to do that because the opportunity is going to show up and and if you are prepared you'll be at the head of the class but it is incumbent upon you to develop yourself if if this 10-year lag between when you should be getting it and when you do get it the other thing Dave I, I've I've taught as an adjunct at Concordia for their MBA program and I know there's a lot of good MBA programs out there that are strongly oriented toward the numbers, your passion of making the numbers sing, but also include some personal leadership development courses. And I, I think probably a, a, a path of studies that direction would be helpful to these young emerging leaders. Yeah. And, and I would just add to that, just to expound on your concept there is the, the idea of being a lifelong learner and, and continue to consume those podcasts and consume those books and continue to learn from other folks and watch those YouTube videos because it'll pay dividends for you in the long haul for sure. Uh, I want to get to my favorite topic, which is something you alluded to in the first segment, which is the impact of leadership on bottom line performance. And for the audience out there who isn't familiar with what I do, I'm a business valuation consultant and I've written a few books that connect the dots between the value of leadership, human capital, and a business enterprise. So love having the conversation. So Andy, we'd love to get your perspective and if you have any stories that you can share on how leadership actually has impacted the bottom line. Yeah. Well, you know, I knew we were going to be talking about this, Dave, so I actually pulled up some recent statistics. Let me share with you some stuff I pulled off the internet recently. 50% of people who work for a bad boss plan to look for a new job in the near future. 65% of employees say they would take a better boss over a pay raise. Wow. 75% of the people at I Googled recently said their boss is the worst part of their job. And, and you can probably speak to this even more strongly than I can. A minimum wage employee can cost up to $2,500 to replace before you get them up to speed. Uh, a a yeah. mid-market manager 
it can be a six figure loss when you have that person turn over. So we are talking about real financial impact of poor leadership. I, I think the most compelling statistic that just rocked me when I when I pulled it up, more than 40% of the people in a recent wage earner survey said they've been verbally, emotionally, or even physically abused by a manager at some point in their career. Th there is a bottom line numbers oriented statistic around effective leadership. Really, that takes me all the way back to, to Jerry, my bad boss that hit me with a stapler when I was on a construction crew so many years ago now. It's expensive to have bad leadership. Yeah, for sure. You, you, you touched on so many things there that I wanted to try and at least comment on. Um, so the cost to replace is something that I talk about a lot and something I do every day in valuing human capital in the areas that we get involved in that. And yeah, it, it, it's huge. When people walk out the door, they're not just taking um, their, their selves, they're taking the, the intangibles within the intangible, as I call it. It's all that institutional knowledge that goes with them, all the, the real nuanced stuff that you, you really can't replace. And then, of course, as you're talking about the impact on uh, culture that the folks that are left behind with leadership that's you know, toxic, as you described it with your bad guy, uh, that the, the, the cost of toxic employees is just huge. Um, the, the evidence that I found in working with uh, and interviewing some of the folks out of Harvard is that the impact of a bad boss or a bad leader is more impactful than having a rock star. Yeah, negatively. Yes. Yeah. Well, and, and uh, you know, as you may recall, my wife and I own some small businesses locally here in Central Texas. I've got about a $4 million small enterprise retail businesses. And when, when we have a bad manager in one of our retail centers, we just personally know if we don't act quickly, it can take us 18 months to turn the corner. It would be better to have a brand new facility than to have a bad manager leading an existing facility. We lose less money launching something than trying to turn something after bad management. Yeah. And shifting gears just a little bit and talking about leadership in a remote environment, um, most companies now, it seems to be that they're doing some kind of a hybrid model where employees are in the office a certain portion of the time and, and working remotely the other times. What, what's your counsel for those leaders who are managing teams remotely, either full-time or part-time? Yeah. Probably uh, three pieces of advice. First, you know, if you and I were to Google LinkedIn, anytime we're on LinkedIn, we're gonna see any number of articles saying death to meetings, no more meetings, minimize meetings, standing meetings, don't hold meetings, and I disagree. Uh, I think the, the leadership life is communicated through meetings. In some respects, the leader's most important job is chief communication officer, and that occurs in meetings. So don't neglect the meetings. Secondly, you model best behavior in those meetings, which means very candidly, your camera's on, you've upgraded your camera, you bought one of those $1,800 Logitech cameras at least three and a half years ago when we all needed them, they were that expensive. You've elevated it a little bit above your eye level. You might have your running shorts on below the waist, but you are dressed for business above the waist. You think about your background, you work on your microphone, you bring your excellence to that Teams call, to that Zoom session, to that WebEx, to that Slack huddle. You model best practice behavior and then you pull it from other people. They need to know that they're expected to be on camera. They're expected to know how to make good eye contact. They're expected to be an important part of the meeting. And then thirdly, Dave, you know, different parts of the country and different parts of the world that your podcast goes into, you know, we're all in different places with mask up, mask down and where we're at. But, but wherever you're at, we all need to recognize the, we still need to be out in the field with our people. There need to be regular meetings on site, whether it's a quarterly all hands meeting, whether it's a, it's a quarterly meeting that you as a leader take and you go around your territory and meet with your people. There needs to be at whatever level you can pull it off face to face meetings. So those three, three, three best practice recommendations leading remotely. Yeah, I, I can't scribble fast enough as I'm as you're as you're speaking here. The things I want to cover with you, and I can't read my own handwriting on a good day. So this is really a challenge for me. And we only have a few minutes to go here, so I want to try and squeeze in as much as I can. But uh, when it, what you were talking about in modeling behavior, I'm thinking about that as kind of an executive presence. And and you mentioned in the first segment about authentic leadership is critical, and I hear that all the time too. 
are, the, are they mutually exclusive, Andy, or can you have executive presence while being an authentic leader? Yeah, oh, man, that, that's a million dollar question. Dave, I'm not even sure I can fully handle that. The interesting thing about my consulting world is, is I, I seem to speak into two verticals. I speak into the financial service verticals. A couple of weeks ago, I was on the 63rd floor of the Hudson Yards uh, high rise along the Hudson River in New York, working with a bunch of financial um, financial managers. Uh, and then I was with the um, Independent Steel uh, Association shortly after that. Guys that, that getting dressed up for them is wearing boots that don't have a steel toe in them. And and practicing executive presence in two different contexts is, is different. Here's what I do know. Ken Blanchard talked about it many years ago in his book, uh, Raving Fans. He talked about it in a customer-facing world. He said, customer mirroring plus one. So, so meet your customer where they're at and then elevate that a bit. And, and I would say leadership has the same trait. That's why I said leaders have to model appropriate zoom etiquette because they've got to raise the bar a bit if you work on the floor of a plant executive presence for you is not wearing a twenty five thousand dollar rolex and a six thousand dollar suit executive presence for you is having jeans that are not torn to sheds and and, and, a, and a nice denim shirt and then it's it's the nonverbals. It's you know five to seven seconds of sustained eye contact. It's body language. It's making your verbal and your vocal and your voice all match together so that people have confidence that you've got a spring in your step. It, it varies in context, but if we can keep in mind that principle of customer mirroring plus one, I think that tells us a little bit about what executive presence should look like. Yeah, and, and I think once you actually start to, to embody that behavior, even if you're faking it till you make it, once you start to, to fake it, so to speak, you start to feel it and you start to actually become it. Andy, real quick, in, in 30 seconds, tell the audience how they can connect with you if they want to learn how to develop their leadership skills. Yeah, neelyleadership.com. There's a calendar link. We can grab a few minutes on the phone or leadershipmaterials.com to download an ebook on leadership communication. Awesome. Andy, uh, unfortunately, we're out of time. It does go fast here, but I can't thank you enough for joining us today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Dave. Keep doing your good work. Thank you. Back at you, my friend. We've been talking with Dr. Andy Neely, who is the founder of Neely Leadership Group, and definitely check out the show notes for the offer that Andy mentioned. Once again, I'm Dave Bookbinder, and I'm the author of The New ROI, Return on Individuals, and The New ROI, Going Behind the Numbers. And it's what I talked about with Andy. It's the connecting the dots between people and leadership and the value of a business. You can check that out wherever you get your books. I want to thank you for watching and listening. Uh, big thanks to the Big Cheese once again for running the board for me today. Please crush that subscribe button so you can stay in touch with all that we're up to. And we will see you next time on Behind the Numbers. Take care, everybody.